Plus, I'm the executive director to welcome you all here to this webinar today. It's a really a, a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening because we have folks uh, literally from uh, from all around the world with us, uh, and uh, we um, we thank you for your interest in Kantara and its uh, its 863 conformance program scheme. Class of approval actually is the technically correct word. Um, with me on on uh, on today's webinar, I have Ruth Puente. Uh, for those of you who are uh, who are uh, running your video, you'll see Ruth um, there in the screen. Ruth is our Assurance Program Director, and she's going to begin uh, begin this webinar, kicking off really with a a um, an overview of some of the the process and how it works and some of the key uh, components that need to be thought about. Uh, she'll be followed by uh, Ray Kimball. He's the founder and CEO of Kuma. Uh, Kuma is an accredited assessor with Kantara, has been for some considerable time. Uh, Ray is, uh, himself has been in the audit business an awful long time, uh, even prior to, to uh, uh, founding Kuma. So it's great to have Kuma's support here, uh, not only uh, with Kantara, but also on this webinar. Now he's going to be followed with Le by Leif Johansson from Sweden. Leif is the chair of the Assurance Review Board. If you look at uh, Leif's uh, LinkedIn profile, you see he's uh, he re he titles himself Chief Troubleshooter uh, from uh, uh, from Sunet, which is the uh, higher ed uh, refeds uh, network there in uh, in Sweden. But as our Assurance Review Board chair. Um, it typifies really the expense of um, of countries uh, and individual um, uh, technical expertise that we have in the Assurance Review Board. Uh, it's spread uh, across different countries and different expertise levels. Uh, Leif is going to be uh, followed by Blake Hall. He's the founder and CEO of IDME. Uh, Blake and Leif and and um, uh, and Ray are also, I think, got all their videos on. Yes, they have. I'm just checking there. So uh, Blake is just waving to you now. He's the founder and CEO of uh, IDME, and he's uh, and and IDME is a an approved um, uh, CSP, credential service provider, uh, under the Kantara program. So these folks are going to be the ones uh, primarily talking to you. Um, if you have questions, I'd like you to put those in the chat, please. And specifically, as you do that, as you put the questions in the chat, if they're um, specific to a particular speaker, you're thinking of those as you go along, please put at Ruth, at Ray, uh, at Leif, uh, at Blake, so that those uh, individuals can actually begin to, um, uh, to start answering the question for you if they have time. Um, if it's just a general question, then no need to preface it, and uh, we'll work it out as we can. If you have a question where you don't want to write it, um, then I want to um, uh, then please uh, just make yourself known that you would wish to ask a question in the chat. That way, we can uh, we know who that is, and we can come to you as uh, as we require. I'll be moderating the chat here, so uh, do your best to help me if you can uh, by doing whatever you can in the chat. If we uh, if we have enough time, we'll unmute unmute the mics um, towards uh, the end of the uh, end of the hour, and we can have a sort of a general uh, free for all and discussion. I do want to note now, just as we uh, are getting pretty much uh, full here, uh, full capacity, I do want to note uh, that. That this uh, this uh, webinar is being recorded, uh, and as we are recording, basically to replay this on folks that for whatever reason can't make it but have registered. And as always, everything is open on Cantara's website. If you uh, don't want your voice recorded, please don't speak, uh, and uh, from you know perhaps uh, use the chat as best you can and, and make uh, yourselves uh, make us aware of of your requirements that way. Um, without further ado, I just want to pass now on to Ruth to kick us off. And thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. It's, it's fabulous. Ruth, over to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Um, well, as some of you may know, um, uh, and, and as Colin already uh, commented, Kantara was formed in 2009. Uh, and since uh, 2010, it was recognized by GSA uh, under the FICOM program as a trust framework provider. And um, through that capacity, uh, Kentara uh, accredits assessors and uh, approves CSPs. And um, the, the identity assurance uh, framework um, is a set of uh, requirements, criteria, uh, processes, and policies that all together uh, define uh, the Kantara approval scheme. So um, under that approval scheme, uh, those companies that provide identity proofing or credential management services and want to get a trusted service or are just seeking uh, compliance against a, a specific standard, they look uh, to get approved under uh, Kantara certification. So, um, and under that approval scheme, we offer uh, several classes of approval. At the beginning, uh, we offer what um, uh, NIST guidelines provided uh, uh, under the, the, the revision two of the uh, NIST identity guidelines, and we currently call it uh, classic class of approval. And uh, since 2017, when NIST released the last version of uh, the identity guidelines, uh, we um, released two new classes of approval. One that is um, the most meaningful, broader uh, in scope, because not only uh, is derived from uh, the NIST technical requirement, but also is um, inspired on ISO uh, standards. Um, and we look not only the technical uh, operations, but also the organizational and business um, um, requirements in terms of uh, good standing as a, as a service provider. And then the technical, it will only look the technical requirements and uh, will be just a clinical review of uh, the operations of the service. So basically that are the, uh, the big difference between uh, the classic and, and, and um, Rev3 and Rev3 technical. And um, something important to stress is that our approval scheme is based on uh, the third party uh, assessment uh, through our accredited assessors. Uh, and uh, Ray uh, Kimball, uh, that's worked for Kuma, uh, will provide you a very detailed approach on how uh, they assess the, the, the credential service uh, providers. And now, on a quick uh, overview of how uh, is the roadmap when the credential service provider applies through all our approval processes, going through assessment, and then how that decision is, is made, and uh, which are the uh, policies we have uh, for annual conformity reviews after uh, a CSP is, is approved on the Cantara. So basically, at the beginning, uh, it's important that the CSP set the scope of what uh, it will be assessed and, and, and approved. And for that, it's important that it provide assertions for what is applicable according to the functions that uh, its service provide. So um, that we will call a statement of criteria applicability. So uh, all that is in scope and applicable, you should, uh, and you have um, a reasonable uh, assurance that you can provide uh, evidence for that conformity, it will be in a scope and uh, applicable. And then we, you have not in a scope or then uh, in a scope, but not applicable. So that will um, depend on, on, on the service that you provide. And then there's another uh, key document that we call it the S3A, when you have to describe your service. And uh, there it's, it's important to set the scope of the assessment and also for, for the approval. So that document will uh, help the assurance review board and also the assessor in terms of uh, assessment and, and approval for the evaluation. Uh, so the, in the initial evaluation, you don't need to go through the assessment because you will have 
uh, uh, an evaluation and review of those uh, documents when you say this is applicable or not, or which uh, service you are providing. And if that fits within the identity assurance framework, the assurance review board will, will provide you green light saying, yes, now you can formally engage with an assessor and plan your assessment. So afterwards, you uh, plan a triennial assessment. So basically, it's a full assessment against all the applicable criteria. And then the assessor will um, uh, will describe its findings and non-conformities in a report that then will uh, be reviewed due diligence by the assurance review board. And with that documentation, the assurance review board will uh, make a recommendation to the board of directors so they can ratify the approval. If it is a conditional approval, there will be, of course, conditions and uh, mitigation plan with uh, uh, a, a certain deadlines on how to achieve and also when you should achieve those conditions to get uh, the, the approval. And, um, and after the board of directors ratify that approval, uh, you, you will get the trust mark. And that trust mark is a three-year cycle, but is subject to annual conformity review. So uh, initially you will have uh, a full assessment, but then every year you should go through a, a, an assessment. But of course, uh, that's in the two uh, following years, the annual conformity reviews uh, will, will be just a reduced in scope. I mean, it, you will be assessed just a subset of that criteria that the CSP has uh, asserted that is applicable to its service. And then if there are changes on the service or management of the of the company or or or, or things that have happened uh, that the assurance review board see that is important to have or or it's required a new uh, assessment and unscheduled not maybe in between the year um, uh, that will will require a, a, another assessment. So basically, those are the the, the biggest steps. And uh, and Ray will will uh, provide you details on <clears throat> sorry on the third party assessment. Liv will provide you um, an overview of how the assurance review board uh, evaluates the application and provides the approval. And of course, uh, Blake will uh, provide you a good use case on how uh, it's important uh, to have a, a Cantara trust mark and to go through this uh, um, approval. Uh, the, the IDME was the first uh, a CSP approved under 863 so I think it's important that uh, you listen to, to his experience. And with that, um, I will ask Ray to, to start. Yep. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ruth. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, yeah, so I have the enviable, well, first of all, I'm, I'm Ray Kimball, CEO founder of Kuma. Um, we have been, we're um, essentially a cybersecurity consultant company that helps organizations, public and private, um, mature their privacy and security services. And um, been members of Qatar for about five years, five plus years now, uh, under the Kuma banner. And uh, as um, Colin alluded to, even prior to Kuma, when I was with Lily and Touche, uh, we were members of Qatar. <laughs> so been around it for a while. Um, I had the enviable task of um, uh, summarizing uh, 63A, B, C, and, all, and the hundreds of pages and requirements in 10 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna give it my best shot. I tried to do this um, as uh, kind of in a, in a bit of a framework so that it provides a good snapshot of the details. I would highlight that Qatar does an outstanding job of um, um, documenting the framework and the requirements in which these, um, these, uh, the assessments are done. And so if you are interested in assessments, I would, I would highly, or being assessed, and I would highly um, recommend going to the Qatar website, checking that information out. Uh, looking at the line by line details, diving in, engaging with one of the certified uh, auditors, um, 
and taking a look at Ruth's slide that she just shared, which actually is a, it's a great summary of the different steps involved. So um, on this slide, I'll, I'll be tackling into um, 863A, which is focused on enrollment and identity proofing, uh, 63B, which is the authentication and lifecycle management. And just kind of touch on 63C um, because it is out there and it is something that's being worked uh, within Kantara. So um, these typically when an organization uh, steps up and shows interest in aligning with NIST 63 um, they may choose uh, to get certified under A and B, um, or they may choose to just get certified under uh, one, just depending on the component and the types of services that your organization um, is putting out to the, there to the federal government. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, 63A, so the enrollment identity proofing, um, when you think about this, you're really looking at the identity assurance level. Um, and kind of going back to the levels, you have one, two, and three, uh, one being kind of the, the least, um, uh, least mature, not the least mature, but the least, uh, I would say, um, stringent when it comes to, you know, what an assessor would be looking for and working its way up to a level three. So when you're thinking about levels um, one, two, and three, most organizations come around level two. Uh, some come in around level three, but we, we also get into the details of uh, what kind of evidence is being collected um, during that enrollment, during that identity proofing uh, process. And that's really the, the critical step um, is understanding the evidence that you're going to use and bring to the table for when uh, you make the decision on, on your, your service and what falls into the scope. And you'll notice some terminology here around superior, strong, um, and fair. And these are levels of evidence and levels of detail and rigor that um, needs to be in place and that are explicitly spelled out in the NIST special pubs as well as the Kantara documents. Um, and so the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about those, level, um, those evidence levels. Okay, so, strength, so what you're gonna see are strengths of evidence. So a lot of organizations will come to the table with some um, different kinds of evidence being used, whether it's driver's license, social security number, phone number, um, I guess address, some other uh, sort of documentation. So when you're looking at the lowest level where, where you're really um, assessing that strength of evidence against what this is, terminology is fair, um, you're looking at pretty much a unique identifier um, or a, photo, a photograph or biometric. Um, and what you'll notice is as you read through the certification criteria, you're gonna see the terminology of ors and ands, which are extremely important as you're going through and trying to determine um, your state of readiness and maturity. So then jumping to the next level uh, of evidence is uh, the strong, strong evidence. So you're showing that um, you still have the unique identifier, you're doing a full name match, However, uh, what, you, what you're adding in here is that the issuing source of evidence has uh, proven or claimed that identity through written procedures. And not only that, uh, so the assessor is looking for those written procedures, but then we're also looking that those written procedures are, um, are subjected to recurring oversight. And so that's a critical uh, piece, and that's why you know, this level of evidence would be considered stronger than fair. Um, we're also looking at a uh, photograph, biometric, or an existing um, link or component service to your overall offering. So if you were gonna be partnered with a um, approved entity at AAL2, let's say, then you can bring uh, the full component um, partner service into that mix. So, and then superior, you're getting into um, photograph and biometric. And, and that's really the, the, the difference there, still going with the written procedures, but we're really looking again for a higher level, le level of rigor. Um, next slide. And then we're getting into the other part of 63A. So we talked about the very first part, which was strength of evidence. Now we're getting into Validating. So, how is how is validation done with the identity evidence? And again, you know, same terminology: fair, strong, superior. Um, 
so in FAIR, you're looking at a lot of worse statements. So there are different ways that you can validate that evidence, whether it's comparing the attributes um, to a published or issuing or authoritative source. You could be um, using trained personnel to, to kind of check on that evidence. Um, so there are different ways that you can come in and validate evidence at the FAIR level. Um, for strong, there's really two things. I, I didn't do a great job with this bullet, but there's really two things that are important here. Um, you're still doing the uh, comparison to the authoritative source. Um, you are still, but, but the key here is you want to use either using an appropriate technology to validate that identity evidence, let's say a driver's license, um, or demonstrating that there are conform, uh, that you're able to um, use trained personnel. And so those are two critical um, areas that I see as um, uh, trouble spots. You know, for organizations that come to the table, they may not be using technology, um, they, but yet they're using personnel, but the training in which the personnel goes through may not be well documented. Um, so those are some things you want to look out for, you know, as you shift into strong and, um, and superior when it comes to validating that, that um, identity evidence. Um, next slide. The third component here of the um, of 63A is we talked about strength of evidence. You talked about you know, verifying uh, um, the uh, validation, and now we're talking about verifying evidence. So this is essentially confirming that the applicant, um, the applicant's ownership of claimed identity by physical comparison um, to the strongest piece of evidence or the biometric comparison. And then we, we go into superior, which we require both the or turns into an and. So in summary, you know, when you're, when you're talking about 863A only, the enrollment identity proofing, um, it's critical that you identify those key pieces of evidence. Um, you know, if you're bringing, coming to the table with a strong or two fares, um, and then thinking through how you're validating and verifying that evidence. Um, and again, the use of technology, uh, the, the rigor in your documentation, the training of the personnel that are doing the validation of the verification is extremely important. And that's two areas that you know, an auditor would come in and, and really hone in on. So, um, next slide. So 63B. So this is focused on authentication and lifecycle management. So this is really... You know, the assurance levels, again, very similar to how the IALs are, are laid out for the um, identity proofing. You know, we're looking at AL1, AL2, AL3. Um, AL1 is, you know, you're either using a single factor or you're using, a, you can be using a multi-factor. Um, and it requires that, you know, there, there's proof of possession and control uh, of the authenticator. For AL2, um, as well as AL3, you're starting to look into remote and in-person um, and supervised remote kind of scenarios of how you're, you're able to authenticate. Um, for AAL2, where we see a lot of organizations kind of focusing their services now in the market, you're looking at proof of possession and control. Um, you are looking for multi-factor or two distinct authentication factors and approved crypto um, technologies. So, and then shifting in, into, um, Three, you're, you're starting to get into the hardware-based stuff. So again, we really focus. What we've seen in the market is that a lot uh, more organizations are focusing around AAL2 right now. Um, oh, one more comment: uh, the level three uh, for AAL and IL are being worked as well um, uh, within within Kantara, and so those should be coming soon. But you can go on the website for the detailed requirements for AAL2. Um, next slide. So some of the things we're looking for, you know, consistent identifier uh, between the subjects. We are looking for the, M the use of MFA, um, whether that's, there's some examples here, multi-factor OTP, crypto, you have, um, you're able to bring two single factors, whether that's a memorized secret with a lookup secret or not a band device. So there are multiple ways that you can um, bring a uh, bring your uh, services you know to bear and to one solution to get certified uh, i think this did a really nice job of trying to think through uh, the different you know complexities and synergies across different um 
different ways to authenticate. And um, so that's, that's captured as best it can. We also dive into life cycle uh, management. So here you're gonna see data retention, privacy and security controls um, as well. And, and uh, so those are things that um, you'll see when you dive into the, uh, the detailed requirements. Um, next slide. So uh, assessment process, Ruth uh, touched on it in that overview slide or in the, um, the Chevron process slide. Um, you know, you want to engage with one of the certified third-party assessors. Uh, there's, a, there's a few of them. You can find them on the Kantara website. Um, your assessment is going to typically, you know, just to give you an idea of how we operate, um, it's usually a pretty standard uh, process if you've been through certification efforts. You know, right? We're documenting, we're, we're asking for evidence collection. We want to know what the two pieces of evidence, three pieces of evidence you're bringing to the table, um, some of the documentation that you have around that, and then we do our analysis piece, um, and that moves pretty quickly. Typical assessments take any take what we've seen anyway is four to six weeks. Uh, typically, what we tell people that can drag out um, on a number of reasons. You know, one maybe uh, evidence isn't ready, uh, documentation isn't ready, the back and forth with the assessor and the SSE, um, there's, there's lag. Um, so di different reasons uh, can probably extend that out a bit, but for the most part, um, that's kind of the, the frame that we, we tell people. And then Ruth already touched on the, um, the cycle. So you have a full certification up front, followed by uh, annual conformity reviews, which you as a CSP, as a solution provider, um, dictate you know, with what we look at, which is diff uh, a bit unique. And then we um, dive into another full-blown uh, certification. Um, and my final slide, I believe, is just real quick high-level best practices. You know, we have a, um, a variety of folks on the, on the line right now. You know, you just you want to understand you know, your need for conducting the assessment in the first place. Um, and we've seen three main reasons. You know, one is you have a customer requirement. Uh, you're, you're seeing that out of federal agencies, and you're going to see it out of more federal agencies. Um, and so uh, that, 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 that's a darn good reason to, <laughs> to get certified. Um, and then you have the competitive advantage route and uh, really differentiating your service and your company and your product, um, you know, knowing that it went through a rigorous assessment process and it stood up to the security and privacy controls of the government. Um, and so that is a, that's a great uh, reason to, to go after the certification as well. And then the third that we see is just, um, we have organizations that want a maturity model or a maturity assessment out there. And from a security and privacy standpoint, um, you know, the, the Qatar framework, the NIST 863.3 um, for digital identity does a really good job. And so we've had organizations just inquire um, uh, because they haven't put their product or service through one yet. Um, Another thing is just review the guidelines. You know, uh, all of the detailed specifications and requirements around what a auditor looks for and what your service needs to meet is is, is uh, accessible through Kantara. And so that is um, that's information that's out there. You know, uh, do your homework, look through them, um, and and you'll get a real good sense of uh, the direction of where the audit would go. Um, and then uh, have have a talk with an assessor, uh, of course, and then just have your documentation ready. Um, and usually the assessors will send out a document request list. And that just gets the assessment off to a smooth start and hits that four to six, six week window. Um, I, I believe that was my last slide. So um, with that, I hope I gave you a overview of um, what can be a complicated process um, when you look at the 63A, B, C, and the different kind of levels uh, within that. Um, at the end of the day, though, uh, it, it's not as complicated as it seems, and uh, it's, it sure is a pretty robust framework to use. Happy to take any kind of questions um, at the end or even offline. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Leif. Thank you, Ray. Um, so uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about sort of what the the ARB does in this process, but let me start by telling you who the ARB is. Um, this is, I, I believe, I try to put it in everybody in alphabetical order. So the, the ARB is um, chartered by Kantara and the, 
there is a charter on on the website you can go look at to provide both oversight and and review and recommendation to the board of trustee for each of the grant of trust use of trust of the trust mark that we issue um and uh, the 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 ARB charter states that the membership shall be gathered from a broad spectrum of of, uh, of um, people who have um, various roles in in the identity ecosystem. And currently, like these are the members. Right? We have, um, I, as you can see, members from uh, the red research and education community, from the assessor community, from uh, from the U.S. government, from other assessment. Um, organizations and, and, and structures like uh, T scheme, for instance, a UK assessment scheme. Uh, and so we, we, we comprise a rather sort of broad uh, set of experiences and, and, uh, and, and, um, and knowledge. Uh, the ARB doesn't actually change that much. It's a fairly stable group um, and has sort of hasn't uh, changed much in well the last few years actually uh, i've been chair of the arb for for quite some time um and i i you know it's both a good and, and bad thing but you know it's a very stable organization we we have like two substructures in in the arb one is the set of voting members and the set of non-voting liaison members we have two non-voting uh, members uh, and what that means is that they don't actually take part in decision making in the ARB. The ARB has two types of decision. I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, but um, the non-voting members aren't sort of active participants in in that, and they have form advisory, basically work as advisors. Um, Ken Dag is one of them who's our liaison to the IWG. And the IWG, of course, is is the group in Kantara that owns these specifications. So, so that's important to remember that Kantara is a membership-driven organization. Uh, it's an open standards organization uh, where, like the 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 main output of Kantara is the assessment criteria that uh, auditors like Gray use to do their their work, but. You know, Ray, as a member of Cantara, also works uh, towards the improvement of those criteria. And there is an active feedback loop from the assessors via the ARB and back to the I IWD that I'll talk to and, and Ken uh, forms a very important link there. And we have a technical expert um, who uh, we consult with, Richard Wiltshire, we consult with on occasion when it comes to um some of the interpretation and language in the assessment guidelines um so next slide please um so like all, at the top of the charter uh, you can read the scope and of the arb and it, it's pretty simple it's to provide oversight of the the whole trust uh, operations uh, and also to review applications and make recommendations now um there are um the arb sort of forms a, an important sort of a, um, function that isn't really revealed by re just reading the, the, um, um, uh, the, the charter. And that is to provide a form of isolation between the customers of assessors and the assessors. So when a, an assessment takes place, Ray contracts or the, 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 the assessors, the assessee contracts with, with uh, an assessor like Ray. Um, so, like Ray gets insight into the secret source of, of whatever your service is, right? He gets to see. He will open up everything. He will he will understand what's going on, right? And you have to reveal some stuff to to Ray that you wouldn't reveal to any to everybody. Now, it's important that that information doesn't doesn't get leaked everywhere. And so, like we take Ray's uh, audit reports, and based on our knowledge of how Ray conducts his audits, and also about our knowledge about the quality and, and expertise that Ray and his company has, and all of the other assessors have. Like we can make a determination that this, con this audit has been conducted in a good way. So like we don't need to see the secret source of every service that gets comes through the, the, uh, the assessor uh, assessment process, but we still provide a very important oversight function. Uh, and I'll I'll talk about that uh, in a second. So next slide, please. Um, so, what what does the day day to day operations of the ARB look like? Well, we meet every Monday. Um, uh, we have typically two types of meetings. Uh, we have review meetings, and we have 
like regular uh, meetings. Typically, when we have a lot of reviews in the pipelines, it's all reviews meet, review meetings, and those take place only with the, the what we call the in recused mode. So these are under special rules that dictate what we can can talk about. And for those meetings, the non-voting members uh, aren't present. Um, they're not on the call. Uh, and uh, during the full ARB meetings, we uh, invite the uh, our liaison. So, for instance, sometimes during our reviews, we will discover an issue uh, with the service assessment criteria. That that's happened uh, on occasion. We've discovered some a, a lack of clarity, for instance, a problem of of how to interpret the language in some of the assessment criteria that comes up in 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 review in actual reviews. And then we will sort of abstract that information out from the review process bring it into a general meeting of the ARB and tell, you know, can maybe you want to go take a look at this together with the rest of the IWE. So sort of we sort of serve as that liaison between the concrete case. We knowledge that like, isn't generally available um, to the more general case, which is discussed in the IWE. Um, there is a quorum process, uh, which is documented on the website, um, but um, I think next slide. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, um, so if we look at like what, would, what typically goes on when we do a service assessment, and let me just say that that like there are actually two kinds of assessments that um, that uh, the AIO does. One, one of them is for looking at service assessments, and the other is for auditors. Um, and those look kind of different because uh, we actually go in and the, the kind of process that Ray described for that, um, that he does for, for services, we actually do for auditors. So when Ray applies for certification as a, as a Kantara auditor, he had to uh, turn in a lot of evidence uh, describing how he fulfills the requirements that we put on auditors. And those requirements are also documented in, on, on, online on the Kantara website. Now, all of those requirements are, they're actually quite stringent and it's not that easy to, for, for Ray to fulfill them and it's not easy for any auditor to fulfill them. But that's the, that's the way we know that the, 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 the aud audits that uh, uh, Ray and his colleagues around the world turn in, that they fulfill the requirements that ensure that we can turn out uh, a good quality uh, assessment product at India. So a typical service review, we actually don't, we try not to do much actually of anything other than to look at this does this make sense right has the auditor does this has the auditor covered all the bases have they reviewed all of the requirements they should be reviewing but we very very seldom go into detail and ask the auditor to sort of expose details about their audit it has happened but on on occasion typically that has involved like a lack of clarity or a misunderstanding or uh, a lack of consensus around the interpretation of, of, of the assessment criteria. And that has almost always resulted in like a subsequent review by the IWD of the standard. So that's the positive feedback loop that I talked about, right? We we take the experience from the auditor and sort of put, put that back into the, to, to improving the quality of, of, of uh, the, the assessment process. Um, Typically, one to two meetings is what we try to like, shoot for in a service, no more. Uh, and after that, our recommendation goes to the board of trustees, who I think with I don't know of any exception. They they sort of they um, they follow our recommendations and issue the the license to, to use the trust marks. Um, but in in practice, because of board of trustees trustees meetings don't happen, I think happen with the sort of with less frequency than the ARB meetings, and it might be a little bit of a delay uh, introduced by that in, until you have the formal approval for your service. Um, and next slide. Um, if we look at what happens for an assessor, well, that will actually take a lot longer because there the ARB, ARB actually looks at evidence. Uh, the assessor produces a ton of documentation describing how they're how they conduct their business, how the, what their audit manual looks like, what their you know, processes look like, how they ensure independence. And if it's a bigger company with lots of audit teams, like there's a, a requirement for how much experience you must be able to demonstrate that you have in your audit teams in order to achieve 
like the requirements of, of being an accredited SR, a Kantara assessor. And all of that takes four to five or even, even longer sometimes. And even assessors who have been like long-term members and long-term um, uh, providers of assessment services in, in the Kantara system are subjected to this. Like every three years, we basically start from scratch with every assessor and make them go through the full documentation um, uh, exercise with us, which you know is an, is an exacting uh, review process, but this ensures like the highest quality uh, from, from the assessors that you can contract via Kantar. Uh, I think, I think that, I don't know whether that was the last slide. Or, yeah, it, it's the last mm -hmm. slide and that yes. means that I'm turning over to Blake, I think. Thanks Leif, I uh, really appreciate that. And thank you for all the time that you've put in as the chair of the review board and, and the work that's gone into that. I'm very grateful for that and for Colin and for Ruth and for Ray and and the critical role that they play in the ecosystem. So um, I'm gonna talk through Cantera's impact from a credential service provider perspective, and we can go ahead and and get into uh, to some of the slides. So you can go ahead and advance to the first one. Um, keep going with, yeah, yeah, there we go. Uh, so the way that we define the problem with digital identity is that uh, your most portable logins like Facebook, Connect, and Google that are portable because advertising companies wanna track you, um, they're not trusted, uh, and, and I'll expound on that in a little bit. Uh, at the same time, your most trusted login with your bank um, or with your employer, uh, it's not portable. You can't log into the IRS with Chase or with Citibank. You can't log into your DMV with your employer login. Meanwhile, the economy is just digitizing at record pace. COVID has amplified that trend, and it's just not sustainable to manage hundreds of passwords, and especially not when you layer identity verification, attribute validation, digital signature, and multi-factor authentication on top of that and expect a consumer to go through a registration process every single time they deal with a high value app. We really believe in the NIST vision of making the login and the data move with the user so that you can have a shared credentialing utility with a system that's designed from the user's point of view. So next slide, please. Um, and uh, one of the things we like to share is that identity, it's so important that we get this right, is that identity underpins literally every transaction in society. If you've ever walked up to a girl in a bar or if you've gone on a, bl a blind date, you know that identity is important. Uh, it is always better to have more data points uh, before you go in to understand what you're getting into and what that other person is like on the other side. And similarly, if you've gotten into an Uber or a Lyft, you've taken a risk. You're getting in a car with a stranger. Um, you're depending on their screening to get it right in terms of your trust and safety. And if you've ever wasted an hour of your life setting up an Apple TV or a Roku box where you're you know, typing in the damn code for Netflix and Verizon and everything else, you know that problems with identity, just linking content you subscribe for to a device that you've purchased introduces enormous friction and waste of time in your life. And so we're very passionate about making um, credentials move with people because we're literally giving people time back uh, at scale. And that's especially important when you talk about government services and COVID and when, when people are really desperate for things like unemployment benefits and, and the work that we're doing in Florida. So next slide. Um, you know, so to dive deeper into some of the most um, adopted, you know, portable logins that are out there right now, like Facebook, Facebook just has a barrier where it can't go into trusted services. And the easiest way that we explain this is like, will Facebook be the identity utility for voting? Like, hell no, right? Like the discourse on Facebook right now and with Twitter is so toxic, it's actually, you know, starting to rip apart our society at the foundations. And, and so, you know, what we're really passionate about is if you can make trusted and portable credentials um, proliferate and get some scale there, you can actually maybe bring verified identities over to the social media platforms where the algorithms can differentiate between real people and bots that are administered by Russian troll farms and everything else that are amplifying this, these really partisan um, posts. Next slide. So what we love about, you know, Cantera, um, there's a lot that we love about Cantera. You know, the, the first thing is that Cantera holds us um, accountable. 
there are no free passes or, or rubber stamps all the way through. Ray and his uh, assessors run a very rigorous and tight ship. And if you doubt that, um, I'd be happy to let you into a conversation with, with our assessor and like Richard Wilshire, where, where you can hear them debating, you know, the specific controls and whether they actually satisfy some of these criteria. And then we get it again when we go to the review board and we've got all those folks um, who are subject matter experts who further, you know, dig into us. And that's what we wanted. You know, I'm, I'm an Army Ranger. I went through Ranger School because I wanted to be vetted so that my caliber would be known from an identity perspective when I stood in front of 45 guys that I was going to lead into combat. They knew when they saw that tab that I'd been through vetting and that I was trustworthy as a leader. It gave me some foundation and credibility. And if you think about, you know, Visa, Visa solved this exact problem for payments. You know, how do you let a merchant and cardholder who've never seen each other transact, you know, in moments and they both understand how the transaction is going to work. And so that Visa or MasterCard Trustmark is, is how we view um, Cantera. It's, it's not bundled into one organization because Visa is both operating rules that they set through governance. In this case, NIST is setting, you know, kind of the operating rules and the standards that if you want to claim, you know, identity assurance level one or two, here's the standard. And then Cantera setting the assessment framework. Um, and if you think about PCI, DSS audits that all go into being able to issue a credit card and to hold on to that data, that, that really is what we're just talking about in an identity context. So we view the Cantera Trust Mark as equivalent to Visa or MasterCard. So we can go over to a government agency or to a healthcare organization and say, not only are we claiming that we meet you know, this level of assurance, but we've actually been audit, audited through a very rigorous process um, and that'll lead me to, uh, to my next slide here where, um, you know, depending on the context, you know, if I, if I focus on healthcare for a moment, the opioid crisis is ravaging a lot of communities. So a lot of states have mandated electronic prescription for controlled substance only. My wife is a physician and she had her DEA number compromise where somebody was, uh, had a you know, prescription pad, just wrote her DEA number on it, was writing prescriptions for opioids way too easy. So the, in the DEA rule for electronic prescription for controlled substances, it says if you have a NIST credential service provider that's been approved by a GSA, you know, approved trust framework provider, hello, Kintera, that's how we're, we're credentialing healthcare providers with prescription authority to, to prevent prescription fraud so that you don't have opioid abuse and ultimately downstream deaths uh, because there's a less secure way of, of doing it. So um, we're helping over 10% of the providers in the country right now that have e-prescription authority. And that ties all the way back from the DEA rules, the NIST standards to the Cantera trust mark. And that's the reason why we're able to pass these DEA audits is because we're able to reference the independent assessment that Cantera and Kuma have, have given to us as an organization. And then if you go over you know, to, to the federal and state government, um, everything from California linked um, their, uh, their voter registration process to their licensing um, flows through the Motor Voter Act. So it's an opt-in you know, registration to vote when you go through an application or renewal. In that case, they don't need proofing, but what they do need is to make sure that the voter rolls aren't tampered with from account takeover. Like when you go through the DMV, they're gonna do the proofing there but they wanna make sure that somebody can't come in, compromise a password, and then maybe move your voter registration from San Francisco to San Diego, which would be a very kind of nefarious way to mess with an election if you go to vote in San Francisco and find out that you've been registered in the Southern part of the state. Um, so as an example, that, that's where an AAL2 policy or AAL3, you know, depending on what the user selects, um, protects the, the voter registration rolls in California all the way over to federal government where VA, Social Security, Treasury, um, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency use us for NIST IAL2 and AAL2 largely to authenticate um, consumers to, to um, government applications. And it's been very successful. So our, our effective fraud rate to date is one out of every 850,000 credentials issued. It is 0.0001 of 1%. Um, meanwhile, our access rates um, are in the 80s and 90th percentiles, depending on the incentive of the user to pass the flow. Um, next slide, please. And what I really want to commend you know, NIST on is opening up these exception pathways. NIST 863-2 
um, opened up, you know, online and remote proofing explicitly. What NIST 863.3 did was say, you know, we need to think about pathways for individuals who are not present in records, for international users, for homeless veterans and things like that. And they allowed for flows that use your face and your government identity documents to be presented without corroboration as long as that's a supervised engagement with a trained agent. And so we call that no identity left behind as a nod to the military routes where we can let everybody, you know, get through virtually. That's proved to be enormously important in the context of COVID. We've helped tens of thousands of Florida um, residents who are blocked from their unemployment benefits. We've largely cleared out Florida's queue. In about 10 days, we're doing thousands of these video sessions every day where people are paying their um, their rent rather than paying their credit card bills and things like that. So really desperate folks that we're helping all the way back to the Cantera assessment is what enabled Florida to trust that we were uh, a reliable service. Next flow, or next slide, rather. And so, you know, the last point is that government agencies spend a lot of money. You know, it's it's a mistake to 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 make a choice to say, oh, it's you know, 25 cents for knowledge-based authentication, so I can't really afford, you know, this IEL2 stuff. It's not true. Um, the Government Accountability Office did a report on the IRS and found that it costs the IRS $54 to authenticate a taxpayer through the call center, $89 to authenticate a taxpayer in person. So if somebody isn't able to get through online and maybe they try 30 times and now it's like 25 cents times 30, which is a lot, it's 750, pissed off customer, they hit your call center, now it's $54. It's way cheaper to spend a few dollars and to deliver a good service like virtual in-person proofing that gets them through in a few minutes and delivers the service rather than to block them or to, to make them go to an in-person channel, which is expensive and might even be a hazard to their health. Uh, and next slide. And so the, the final thing is that, um, you know, the way that we work, and this goes back to Ruth's point around scope, is an organization defines the right authentication policy for the transaction they're gating. Um, our technology allows uh, government agencies to upgrade their own login system to NIST IEL2 and AEL2 instantly, as well as our own. So folks can choose the credential provider of their choice. And ultimately, because of that total cost of ownership slide, you increase access, um, you decrease cost, and you have more funds to allocate to other uh, elements of your business and organization that can help people. Um, that might be true edge cases where, where you now have more resources to go to go help them. And so as an economics major who's a uh, study of the uh, efficient allocation of scarce resources, that is, uh, that's pretty awesome when you can see how it makes a positive impact in people's lives. And thanks for your time. It's great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Blake, Leif, and Ray. That's been, and Brooke, that's been marvelous. And uh, we, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we do have a little bit. And I see uh, our speakers have been very good by answering uh, questions uh, in the chat as we go, uh, as they realized we were pushed for time there. But we do have one um, that, I, that, that remains unanswered. And um, I think it's probably, it's from Subari. Uh, Gupta from Electrosoft, since Kantara SACs do not include assessment methods, the assessor has to find a suitable method to assess each requirement. Does the ARB vet the assessment methods used by the assessor as part of the ARB review? Leif, could you answer that one perhaps? Sure. Um, so there are a couple of, of answers to that. There, there are uh, a couple of controls we apply. One of them is the RACs, right? The, the required assessor skills and, and uh, and um, see what, what actually does it mean? It's the required assessor knowledge and skills. So I have 16 tests, um, and that's part of the core Cantor uh, IAF documentation, and it, it sort of sets down how um, a what an assessor needs um, to be able to do, and how what the the skill level and the the methods that they must um, that they need to be able to to bring to bear in an assessment. And that's the main document we use when we assess uh, when we um, evaluate assessors in the ARB. So I, the, the fact that we know that all assessors working in the in the program has passed this bar, that we know that, that they apply the the uh, the right level of rigor to an assessment. Now the detailed methods to check each evidence is up to the assessor. Uh, 
and um, it, it, you know, it, it's a it's not a common occurrence, but it does occur when we do, and this is one of the reasons why we have an ARB review of all, all of the service assessments, that we do discover situations where like, we, we as the ARB don't understand how an assessor has come to a certain conclusion about a piece of evidence. And this is why we, like, this is first of all, why we do the assessments of, of and check the, the assessment, but also that's how we discover like when there are when there's a discrepancy when there's something and invariably right in this situation it turns out to be a, a lack of clarity in the SAC and something that can be fed back into into work in the IWE so we, we sort of tend to improve like our collective understanding of how to do these assessments over time right so I think part of the answer is racks the other part is well we we actually go and do the the uh, that's why we check each each service assessment but another part of the answer is like this is why every auditor and everyone who's actively engaged in in sort of contributing to the system should be an active member of the I, IWD and contribute there because that's how we know that's how we sort of form a a, a joint consensus around how to apply the criteria that's great um we have uh, thank you so much ruth we have two uh, two minutes left. I do see there's um, a question r coming right at the end here from JJ to myself. Does Kantara think that recently published NIST conformance criteria will impact uh, the existing SAC, the 63.3? Uh, and will, um, yeah, will Kantara publicly comment on the forthcoming 63.4? Well, let's let's take uh, very briefly for the first the first one. Um, will it impact I, that's that's interesting i we rather see it as a, a very complementary uh notion at least we've got to appreciate that that uh you know NIST uh, developed or, or or published those because it was a result of the omb's uh, m1917 and gsa uh is is really uh leading the charge as to how the impl uh, implementation is going to be so it's rather it, it's not really kind of a, a question that we can necessarily uh not necessarily predict and and form a position on uh because primarily you've got you know uh, one agency publishing one federal agency publishing and the and the other one uh, directing the traffic if you like so uh we certainly uh, at least our going in position is it's going to be complementary uh we think it's going to be a great help in fact anything that's uh, that uh, works towards whether it's the NIST performance criteria the uh, the uh, MITRE template uh for identity proofing all of these things go to help us uh, move towards uh, a better place and we think towards third party uh, assessment and auditing such that Kantara provides much albeit at a more fine grained um, perspective than than perhaps uh, the performance guidelines but on the second one uh, will we will we certainly going to provide comments publicly uh, well generally I, I think you'll find that 634 is probably going to be on github and uh, as we've done in the past with with uh, uh, we've supplied comments, and I think NIST is very good about making those very open. We expect to be able to do that. Uh, any the mics are open, I understand. Uh, any very quick last questions in the remaining seconds that we have, folks? Open questions from the floor. Hearing none, going once, going twice. We're calling it a wrap, folks. We will call it a wrap there. Uh, Ruth has just said we'll start gathering comments on 63.4 uh, on the IAWG meeting tomorrow. It's uh, next on its very full plate. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank especially the speakers uh, for uh, great work there, great coordination, much appreciated. Thank you, audience. Uh, be sure to round back with Kantara. Look at the website resources. Uh, it's going to be probably a week or so until we can get the recording done, um, completed and uh, cut correctly and the uh, slides posted there. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day wherever you are in the world. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.
I think we're just about, uh, I think that's just about everybody. Yes. One, I think that might be Jimmy. Yeah. No, it's okay. Okay. So. Oh, wait, 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 I'm... wait. 